Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. We've got uh, some more people, some students, and some faculty, which is great. Um, this is our last session uh, for this event, and we're thrilled to have uh, Dr. Alexander come up again and talk to us uh, or help guide a discussion about educational technologies and the future of educational technologies uh, for the remainder of the time. Just to, uh, because many of you weren't here, I'm just going to briefly read uh, Brian's bio again. Uh, Dr. Brian Alexander is an internationally known futurist, researcher, writer, speaker, consultant, and teacher uh, working in the field of how technology transforms education. Uh, his PhD was completed at the University of Michigan with a dissertation on doppelgangers in romantic era fiction and poetry. Awesome. Um, in 2013, Brian launched uh, a business called Brian Alexander LLC. Uh, through his consulting firm, uh, he, he reaches out to higher education uh, in the United States and abroad and speaks on uh, and, and publishes frequently on uh, articles uh, and topics associated with educational technology. Uh, he is currently writing a book called Transforming the University in the 21st Century, The Next Generation of Higher Education, and he's writing it for uh, and through Johns Hopkins University. So without further ado, let me introduce Brian Alexander. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, those of you who just got here, welcome. Who are you people? <laughs> you just waved your head and you have a fox in your shirt. Yes. Who, who are you? What do you do here? Uh, Robert Jacobson. I teach mathematics here. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. We were talking about teaching math just when you came in, I think. Oh, man. The Apple people were here and then apparently I've scared them off. Um, <laughs> how about the rest of you guys? Who are you all? Hi. Um, I run the academic support program at the law school. Oh, okay. okay. You're sitting next to two librarians. Do you know that? No, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a special place. And who are you? International program development. Oh, fantastic. Now, does that mean? Well, you look familiar. But remind me, do you, do you, are you working with international students or programs about international? talking about a Middle East program I was running and secure methods yeah. of communicating with students in difficult circumstances. How's the program going? Um, it is, uh, we're transitioning at Roger Williams to another model. That program is running. Well, thank you. I would love to hear more when you can. Various reasons, yeah. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Um, and you, sir, you're growing a beard. That's a good start. I'm growing. <laughs> <laughs> I have to trim it more often. Uh, I'm a okay. bird from biology. Oh, what well, part of biology? Are you in cell biology? Are you in anatomy? Nice to see you. And who else am I missing? Hello in the back. Excellent. That's better than the rest of these guys. What do you study? Um, I'm a sophomore. I'm studying criminal justice. Oh, excellent. What do you want to do with that? Um, I'm hoping to become a lawyer. Well, you're in the right building for that. The right room for that. We can put you up front. You know, you could address the jury. Good luck. Good luck. And you heard what your provost said. It is all about you. It's quite true. And who came in? Yes, you came. I should say I'm a student. <laughs> but you blew no, it now. Okay. It could be. You um, could be. Institutional research. Oh, Jen great. Where are you based? Are you in the library building or are you in the... Actually, we're in the administrative building. That makes sense. <coughs> Did I miss anybody else? No? No? Hi. Hi. Good. Uh, I'm a staff member uh, at the Media Tech Service Desk in the uh, University of Denver. Oh, very good. Very good. Um, well, thank you for... Um, um, Thank your whole organization for letting us stomp all over the place and use your network and your stuff. Thank you. And who else? Hi. Hi. Liz will be um, faculty in the business school management. Oh, great. Excellent. Excellent. I was mangling a whole bunch of macroeconomics earlier this morning, so maybe we'll come back to that and you can help us out. Okay. Um, and were you here before? <laughs> okay, so it's, it's like the end of Wizard of Oz, right? I around, though, so I you, Oh, okay. You were there, Scarecrow, and you, Tim. Okay, okay. I think we're good. Unless you're new. I just walked in. <laughs> ah, who are you? Introductions. Uh, I'm Ryan Sherry. I'm a grad student with the Masters of Public Administration program. Oh, good. So I'm here to hear what you have to say. Well, that's a good thing. Right? That's a good, the timing is perfect for that, one could say. And we have another librarian from the University Library. Brand new. What do you do? Charlotte. Hmm? What do you do, Charlotte? I just started on Monday. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> well, what have you done so far? <laughs> are, are you serials? Are you reference? Are you government documents? Outreach? or? 
Uh, right now, I'm the liaison for the business school. So oh, she's oh. the representative of the person. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, excellent. First librarians are special. So that earlier, and I, and I believe it. Welcome. Um, well, I'm glad to see this wide variety and strange diversity of people. Um, this morning, I gave a presentation and uh, covered a wide range of topics about the future of education and technology. And that was largely me yapping a lot and showing you slides that uh, were not quite as appellicious, but were still, I think, pungent. Um, but I wanted to hear more from you. And for the next time, the next 40 odd minutes or so, uh, we had in mind was for you to share your thoughts and concerns about this topic, and then I would help facilitate a discussion. Uh, I have a browser open here so I can show you things um, and throw them open. And in fact, uh, I was about to show you a one minute video that might disturb you. Um, but that's the goal. Uh, I have a whole bunch of topics that I've noted that came up this morning uh, that I would like to return to. Uh, and by came up, I mean that you surfaced, not that I, not that I did. Um, does that sound like a good plan? Okay. Well, think about, those of you who have been here today, think about what you've seen and thought about and what occurred to you, and then get to watch the spectacle of someone typing in a search box. It's really exciting, actually. <laughs> and those of you who were not here, let's see if we can get Oh, no, that's not the right one. Well, I'm going to have to find it from the web itself. There we go. Oh, Boston.com, it might work. Let's we'll see. Uh, have you all seen this already? Now, this morning I was talking about automation, and I used that phrase to include a wide variety of software, algorithms, AI, and even big data analytics, as well as hardware, thinking about robotics as well as other devices. I just wanted to show this, because this is a company that's a nearby company that's very, very creative, and they have this fascinating sense of the uncanny. There's also a Black Mirror episode. If you haven't seen the show, I, I do recommend it. Um, that is very much about this. Um, this is uh, called, Hey Buddy, Can You Give Me a Hand? I'm just gonna play it without any other explanation. Now, one question that comes to mind is, what part of its body did it use to open the door? <laughs> well, what else do you think when you see that? What are some of your responses? They don't have to be sophisticated, necessarily. Collaborative effort. Yeah. yeah. You see that from the title, and you see it from the operation. Yeah. True. I think of the Terminator. <laughs> Little, in the sense of being uh, frightening, or being... Uh, the machines taking over, kind of. Yeah. yeah. What do you do here? Remind me. Pardon? What do you do here at the Roger Williams? Well, I'm a writing teacher. Ah, oh, fantastic. I mean, are you doing creative writing or, or communication or composition? College writing and professional writing. Excellent. But I teach online. Russ taught me everything I know. <laughs> oh, and then, and then you, he teaches your students through you. That's kind of uncanny, too. That's collaboration gone a little too far. But good, yeah, there's, there's something creepy about this, a little unsettling. Yeah, please. I sort of have the opposite, and I automatically thought how adorable it was, yeah. which I often find with robots, which I think is interesting. Yes, yes. Right between the two of you is, is this aisle, this, this gulf, and this is how a lot of people react to, <laughs> to robots. You probably know the uncanny valley idea. Um, and we, we have that 
we hate it or we love it, and that we're really, it's, it's hard to pin down at different times. Um, when you mention the Terminator, it's interesting that they keep picking physically attractive people to be the robots. So you have that mixture of, of, of hatred and despair as well as admiration or love. Yet when they strip away the fleshy facade, they become the most terrifying object of, you know, what technology. Or governor of California. Or yeah. the governor. <laughs> yeah. well, please. No, I'm just saying it's the same thing. So, yeah. Yeah. The, it, it's, it's uncanny to watch for, for a lot of reasons. Um, and, yeah, please. Well, to me, I was struck by the sort of the anthropomorphizing, is that the right word? Yes. The humanistic qualities of yes. both robots, and that one was intuiting that the other one needed help without watching. It came sure. over to help, which was his very human. So that's a key part of collaboration, something that humans do. Right. But at the same time, we don't know how those are programmed. They may not right. be communicating with each other at all. So you know the mechanical Turk idea? There's several centuries of people practicing and building uh, fake robots or real ones. Uh, and actually, Edgar Allan Poe wrote some devastating articles where he proved the chess playing robot was actually a guy in a box uh, moving things around. So, with this, we don't know to what extent this is autonomous uh, or pre programmed as the machines are going through, or there's an operator behind one of these, you know, one of these objects. Um, at this stage, I mean, Gerald Dynamics is a pretty amazing company. They could, they could do any of those things. Um, but that's a key point. I mean, a lot of this, a lot of these developments are done behind a veil that we have to get behind in order to understand more. So this is a little glimpse of the future. It's a day and a half old. I'm sorry, um, but but when we look at robots, we keep building them. And when you mention that they were cute, one of the things that's interesting is that we we do have that affection, but also these are semi um, anthropomorphic. I mean, that is that they. You know, when I ask the question about what part of the body does it use, I mean, in many ways, to build a robot that looks like a person is unnecessary. Um, and most industrial robots look like nothing else. They, don't, they look like a functioning tool. So we might expect more of this. But I want you to think about that. Now, coming back, coming back to the, some of the topics that have bubbled up before, as we were thinking, uh, let me ask you the question that um, our Apple representative uh, mentioned, which is this idea that we have many businesses that don't physically own content, but serve as mediators or platforms. So we mentioned Airbnb, you mentioned uh, Skype, uh, Netflix. Um, is it, you know, Netflix is the biggest video provider. They don't own a single theater. They said that in education, we should think about that. I wanted to ask you, is that a model that education, that would actually work in education? Should we expect somebody like uh, EDX or Coursera or a startup in some Providence garage or some large company like uh, Google to provide an interface that we that students could then access and get outflank us as we do higher education. Is that possible? And if so, how could it work? Yeah, please, Russ. Brian, one of the topics that came up. This is a, one of the exact topics that came up over lunch. I was having a wonderful discussion. Um, is this idea of um, publishers? owning content, so they, they publish the textbooks, and there's a cost of the textbook, say $129, whatever. But in, in an effort to, uh, to grow as a company, now they're creating curriculum. And they're publishing their textbooks with a canned curriculum, like curriculum yes. in a box. Yes. And a lot of faculty that I've spoken to over my you know, time here um, are, are uh, not afraid, but, but question, you know, who who assesses that content? And 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 what? And a great question is what gives the publishers the right to publish the curriculum? How do they know, right? That they're not traditional universities, or they're not colleges, or they're not educational institutions right. that right. would otherwise be deemed as acceptable by a governing or accrediting body to say that this is a curriculum that's acceptable for this particular class. So um, I think that that there. Uh, might be something we want to focus on too, is to think about this idea of publishers moving to, from content just to, into curriculum. If I go, excuse me, tell me your name, I'm sorry. Lauren. Lauren, um, when you were mentioning that we couldn't tell what was actually happening behind the curtain, so there's this, it, it's a similar theme, this has come up a couple of times, the transparency and opacity, that you have to wonder, does the publisher make these decisions uh, transparent and accessible to us? Is there an advisory board of instructors in the relevant fields, for example? Are there expert thinkers built in? Or is it completely in a black box? 
that'd be one question to ask. But having publishers move into this is an interesting idea. Uh, if you take a look at Elsevier, for example, uh, which is actually read Elsevier, they've been publishing an awful lot of scientific content. And what they do now is they add to it tons and tons of data and data analytics. So if you want to get, you publish an article about architecture and you want to see where it goes, you can trace its responses, its links and citations with a great deal more data, a lot more power than you had before. So that's the way the publisher can make some value for themselves. Now, if, if you write an article on architecture, which I'm surprised I haven't mentioned in the past half hour, I've left you alone, I'm sorry. Um, I know, I know, I have to talk about, I have to make some terrible Hungarian joke. But, um, but if you do, then that, that is an extra benefit than publishing open access. I mean, so if you're hosting an open access journal, say, and, and, and she publishes it, great, there's the PDF, we're good. But if Elsevier can say, yeah, well, there's all this data we can add to it, the publisher gets to add value. Uh, that's, that's, is that a way of giving somebody outside of the usual spectrum uh, a way in? Yeah, that might be one way forward. I think that's what they do in like high schools. You know, they're all set up where they have to follow this curriculum. Yeah, Common Core. Yeah. Is uh, Rhode Island a Common Core state? I, that's a lot easier to do, especially in public higher, public K through twelve. Does this question make sense? Is it, or is this, just a, a, this is assuming that we're doing this coming together as a high school, or are we doing it separately like Netflix? Is that part of your question? Are we, are we coming together to, to share the curriculum, or are we doing it separately alone? That's a great question. Uh, it, may fr it may really free up the uh, curricular question so that uh, you would have, a, say, another company that creates a curricular map or uses one of many that are published and accessible and then runs with that. So, you know, you think about a curricular map for uh, biology or engineering, you can find many, many models for that, and a company could point to those, uh, or just point to all the content that's, that's publicly available. But what field are you in? I'm sorry. I, um, I work with the architect. I'm also an architect. I'm co-teaching the class on Campus of the Future with the school. At the Fantastic. Fant I'm an urban planner by trade ah. and specialize in higher education planning, physical higher education. Wonderful, wonderful. We could just forget everybody else. Just you and I could talk. <laughs> um, so I'm, 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 I'm admittedly a, pro per, a proponent of you got to get together to learn. Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, right. And um, definitely, we'll, we'll kind of to some extent argue that that has to be a component. Blended is okay, but you have to get together and be part of the community because that's where learning really happens. So maybe, quote unquote. <laughs> maybe that's what stops. Maybe that would stop such a platform from happening. Uh, is that. Uh, Schools like RWU are very, very good at getting people in a residential space or a commuter space, depending on how it's set up, and that that's something which can't be disintermediated, <coughs> unless we think about Airbnb. Uh, so maybe there's a way to get students together in another space. I, mean, I, I don't have a quick answer to this question. Uh, I thought the, the Apple representative's uh, question was very intriguing, and I don't see an answer. I don't see anybody else who's done this yet. I do know that some of the MOOC providers, uh, Coursera, EDX, uh, Udacity, try to do this, uh, but they're actually producing their own content, much like um, they're acting as publishers, basically. I, th I think one of the fears that was um, verbalized, if not at launch, then certainly over conversations that I've had with other faculty, is what, do, what does that mean for the role of the professor? It's, it's no longer, in a situation like that, if that, if that was to be a, an acceptable form yeah. of class, per se, if you want to call it that, what does the professor become? Is, you know, how, how does that uh, position evolve? Well, if I, if I could ask, that's a fantastic question, and it's one that we didn't address enough this morning. If I could ask, first of all, the faculty here who are involved in teaching, um, how are you seeing your role changing? And think back over your career, say back over the previous 10 years, how do you see these, these conditions changing? I mean, do you feel yourself making the move from the classic move from sage on the stage to guide on the side? Uh, do you feel more in touch with the personal face-to-face -face, uh, experience than before? Yeah, please. Well, it's complex from a, philo from a philosophy perspective, because as a woman in philosophy, I'm still uh, a minority. Yeah. But I don't yeah. believe in hierarchies. So I'm simultaneously trying to be a woman in philosophy, but I don't believe that I'm filling empty heads with knowledge where right. it's equal yeah. playing ground. 
but the community is needed <laughs> for what is it in philosophy as well. What kind of philosophy do you do? Are you Anglo-American, continental? I am continental heavy, but I believe in a bridge between analytic and continental and pragmatism. Oh um, I like all philosophers. But uh, uh, I teach critical philosophy of race, uh, philosophy of education, and early modern. So no, oh. no, whatever. Here I do intro, all that. Cool. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, when I was in grad school, I hung out with uh, Ed Curley, and we kept doing oh, lots yeah, of stuff. I, and, I know him personally. Yeah. yeah that's a, wow, weird. Yeah. Well, Big Spinoza guy in America. North America's biggest Spinoza scholar, Ed, Edwin Curley. Sorry if I haven't established my nerd credits enough. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I was really interested in the Italian autonomous take on Spinoza. Anyway, um, yeah. um, yeah. but this is, uh, well, but you tell me your name, I'm sorry. Chris Rawls. Chris, you've, you've raised a whole series of, of, of questions. If, if I could unpack a few of these at once. Yeah. Uh, once is, one is the uh, question of, um, of pedagogy. Uh, so the, I can't remember his first name, I'm sorry, the upper representative talked about constructing. Were you here when he was giving his? Sorry, I wasn't. It's okay, he's describing the, his background of being a nursing professor. Um, Professor teaches nursing, rather, professor who is nursing at the same time. And he said that he was um, learning constructivism backwards, that he was actually doing constructivism, and then he found out that's what it was called. And so that's, of course, the opposite of the banking method you described, um, of just filling you know, empty heads with bright thoughts. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so there's this interesting pedagogical divide, and one of the things I'd be curious to see is if we managed to unbundle the university, you know, breaking this, all these functions up, what kind of pedagogy would follow out? For example, uh, as uh, a few critics like um, uh, George Siemens and uh, Audrey Waters have pointed out, a lot of ten lot new startups are coming up with pedagogies that are basically behaviorist. That is, you know, you fill in these blanks, click these things, and then you get rewarded or punished in a kind of basic way of you know, mastering the material rather than making content and discovering a path through it. So that's one piece. The second, and I'm going to condense this too far, I think, is your point about gender. And you'd wonder how gender would play out in this. So, for example, if we have a society that is structured patriarchally, then would such a, a, a vendor or platform, then re, how would it reproduce that? Would we see, for example, people taking more classes from Ed, because he's a male, rather than from you, uh, because you're clearly not marked as a male? I mean, that would be an interesting problem. Um, how am I doing so far? Yeah, you said, how do we see the position of professor evolving and what would happen? And I think it's complicated from a female perspective when it comes to being a, in a discipline where there's no, or very few yeah. females or persons of color. Yeah, yeah especially Anglo-American philosophy, which is really, really male. Yeah, yeah please. So I think, I mean, I, I think you've already, uh, from, from lots of different points from the faculty perspective, from other people in the institution, I already have a, a conversation, a, a contention, differences of opinion about about what we do as as faculty, and and, and you know, it, it's it's to me personally, from my my philosophical perspective, kind of horrifying to think that I'm nothing more than a conduit of of, of content that's filtered down from somewhere else. That a publisher develops something, and then I just give it to the students. Uh, that, that's like my nightmare scenario. <laughs> um, and, and I think, you know, uh, very related to this is, is the notion that, that uh, I, I'm looked at as a way for my students to eventually get a good job. Right? That's not, I don't feel that that's my role, even though that's a great side effect of what I, I teach math, right? Like that's a great side effect of, of math, of knowing a lot of math is, is potentially you can make a lot of money with it. Uh, legally too, yes. Legally, <laughs> legally. Uh, you know, I, 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 I want to mentor students during their, their education, and it's the students who find their way through, through their, so I'm, I'm holding their hand, giving them uh, a, a guided tour of their ignorance. <laughs> and I could do any of my classes without a textbook, and any of my colleagues could do the same, right? So uh, I, I had a colleague um, who, I, I won't name, not in the, in the room, but, but this colleague told me, such and such a professor, uh, 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 such and such a publisher, they are the experts in teaching X. And I, I just thought to myself, like, wow, their marketing department is really working well, right? Like, what actually goes on behind the scenes in these publishers is they're sending me desperate emails. Do you want to publish your textbook with us, right? And, and I know what, who, I know people who sit on the boards whose names end up in the front of the textbook mm -hmm. about, 
you know, who, who was the advisors to the text, and I, and, and, and so the view from, from the inside is so different from what may appear to be the view from the outside. Well, let's, maybe, maybe really this is a, a bimodal thing. Maybe it's possible for a, a third party, who could be an academic unit, but you know, um, it could be Harvard or whatever, um, but they, they produce a content-heavy, publisher-heavy uh, gateway into a lot of content. And right now, the web is, has tons of content. I mean, I mentioned, were you here this morning? I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's okay, it's okay. No, no, no. I just didn't want to repeat myself. Uh, this morning, for the rest of you guys, I can repeat myself, that's fine, but, but for him, I'm more. Um, but I was talking about open education resources, and one of the things is now there's just so much of it that's of, on average, good quality that we can point to things. And one of the ways that we train AIs is by giving them something like Wikipedia and say, go, think, you know, we'll train on this. So, okay, that's one model. We could have that kind of gateway. We could set up an Airbnb uh, or uh, Netflix for educational content, for post-secondary education. And then what you described and what you described, Chris? Yes. Okay. Um, so, do you know the Dunbar number? This is a great thing to know. This is so awesome to know. Um, my background is, is English, and we can borrow from any discipline at all, right? So anthropology, Paul Dunbar's anthropology. Have you ever heard of this? I love this. He was looking at social networks in New Guinea, not online, but face-to-face. -face. He was trying to measure how many people a given person could know by name and face. So he came up with a number. It was about, I'm going to fudge this. It was about 120. And then he published it. It was done. And then he moved on, and someone replicated this and had the number of like 118. It's really close. So other people have been studying this. They've got numbers ranging from 110 to 130, maybe as high as 140, as low as 100. It seems to be a built-in you know, hardware limitation in the brain of how many people we can know by name and face. It's really interesting. And then you can push that like with memory tricks in different ways. Some people fall, have, have fall off the page with this, like if they have prosopagnosia, for example. But it's really interesting. And so whenever I travel, I go to a campus, I start feeling the Dunbar number creep up. And thinking, ah, oh, okay, I'm going to hit somebody's name. Oh, no, it just fell off the page. So that's why I'm glad that I remembered you. We do it with students all the time. Yes. When I have 75 students, I'm working on all the names. Think about that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a real issue. Perfect number for a residence hall. <laughs> <laughs> and you can stay there, right? And then, and then repeat all these numbers and, and get... And then, yeah. And you could possibly design buildings around that, just as a, as a hint. But what you're describing and what you're describing is a pedagogy that's very, very different. Um, I mean, I'm using constructivism as one phrase, but also very student-centered, in which the faculty member is someone who's helping them think and helping them, as you said, uh, conduct a tour of their ignorance and, and mentoring as well. Now, the tour of the ignorance is interesting because you can map that out pretty objectively and pretty clearly. But we're describing something much more personal and also, I think, much more variable. And those are two really, really different models. It could be that second model is what this university gets to do well that nobody else can replicate. I mean, in a sense, we've just rediscovered liberal education, but in, in a sense, no, because you know, we're talking about something that's much more student-centered, and so far, based on the conversation, not necessarily something that can't be done online. So that's an interesting division. Is this making sense here? You look kind of stuck. You're a student. Is this making sense to you? Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when, when this math prop, do you know this guy? Okay, so when, when he said, you know, yeah, t you know, getting a career isn't necessarily the first thing uh, uppermost, I was going to ask, is that okay with you? You know, but, okay. Well, nobody, I mean, I know. everyone has to I'm picking that, right? I'm picking But that's my, like, I hope. Oh. Into it. Well, then, let me, please, please. The whole human dimension with this somehow. I'm looking yes. at, you know, Netflix and Airbnb yes. and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Not here, but in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these connect. A need with a consumer, like a, a need with a product. So right. there's no right. nothing else than just connecting dots uh, in time and space, right? And education is not about that. It's not about content and people connecting dots. It is really about community. And I have to come back to Dennis and about mentoring and community and and growing up. I mean, these are 18 year old yeah. kids who come to their own, and you know, whatever. We hope, um, we hope it's not a commodity. Uh, Right, so I think there's a whole lot more to education. The question is, how does that come into this, and how much do you of that do you shoulder, and, and how can you connect? Can you unbundle that? And, and if so, then, and then what, what does that look like? Can you say that, yes, if you go to Providence, you take a class there, and it doesn't really right. matter? 
Mm. Because it's more important for it to be com uh, convenient than to be um, with people with whom you already have a, a established relationship. So how does that feel into this world? That's fantastic. Uh, Please. See, we have to so many hands. Well, you have to look at the difference between a current 18-year-old and us. To me, being together is co-located. Uh, for an 18-year-old, being together is merely connected. So if I've got an eight, if two 18-year-olds are on their cell phone a thousand miles apart, they consider themselves to be together. Uh, and that's a whole lot different than me. Uh, I consider somebody to be together here. R Not roughly, by my phone. I'm sorry, I don't mean this in a, in a personal way. How old are you? How old am I? Uh, 29 with experience. That's <laughs> very good. And uh, our, our friend from... Formally young. Our, our friend from public administration, how, how old are you? I'm going to guess 26, am I right? Oh, thank you. 32. You're welcome. Um, how do you feel? Because you're right in the middle between these two people. I mean, do you, do you need to be physically with someone to be together? Or is the online, is the online world enough? Uh, I think I'm stuck in the middle between online and being connected because I'm very torn between, for instance, like learning, because I'm in grad school. I love the brick and mortar of going, listening to a lecture, but I also like the ability to be able to just connect at the house and mm -hmm. not have to go to, to school or if I'm stuck at work and I can't get out, I can just open up my laptop and be able right. to talk to people online. Actually, that was... Um, so I'm, I'm torn in between. Have you seen this guy before? The technical term is telepresence robot. Oh yes, that's the one um, that projects a person so they can see, they can, uh, from, you can, you can present from home yeah. to uh, uh, a lecture hall. Yeah, it's, um, I, I call it a doppelbot. Um, other people call it iPad on a stick. Uh, and it's shown up in a few different uh, TV shows. Years ago I used one and went around the philosophy department knocking on the doors of my colleague telling them I had a mind-body problem. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Just my head is on the screen. Cartesian humor. Man, there's not much like it. That's really good. We take that as stealing or kidnapping. Is that Russ? It's Russ. Maybe me. It's really, if you haven't been around these, they're, they're a lot of fun. I've, uh, I've presented at conferences uh, thousands of miles away with these, and uh, they really do uh, change dynamics a bit. Can this one alter its height? It can. So I, I was able to roll over and sit down at a table. Um, no. It's really great when you just put your face on the whole thing. <laughs> Freaky. We've dressed it up. Um, I teach, oh, I taught at another school at an 18 year old um, urban. School, and this is when I had gotten a grant to get one of these. We, and it's a professional school, so we had to dress up in suit and tie. So <laughs> we put a tie on it and like oh, a nice. suit jacket on a coat hanger. Uh, it's kind of fun. So this is, this is maybe a more, tell me your name, I'm sorry. I'm Ryan. Ryan? Yes. That's a good name. You're short one letter, but almost perfect. <laughs> um, I'm Brian, by the way. Right. So, um, so this is another example of that kind of quick connection. So if you're at home and you can't go out, people have used these uh, when they physically can't get somewhere. Um, so we've seen people do this during fires or during accidents. Uh, people use these from hospitals. What I'm waiting for is for hotels to have a clutch of these uh, at the front desk, for conferences, that kind of thing. Um, I'm glad I could pick on you because you're at 32. You're in the right age just, just for this. Um, but it may be that uh, it may be that we have a, a different sense of community, uh, one that's emerging as we go. If, if if I hang on one second, if if I could walk back when you're talking about connecting dots and content, uh, I did want to say uh, I, I'm not sure that may run afoul of the library's mission. Uh, if I can go back to Raganathan's famous slogan, which is for every person their book, right? Um, in, in part, you do that work of connectivity, of connecting people. I mean, you have three days of experience of doing this, so I know there's a lot. Here. <laughs> well, I don't know anything else beyond that. I would, I would have to ask you, which of course is what one should do with librarians. Um, but, the, but that is part of your function, is to connect people with resources. Uh, so, and that's that's part of part of the academic life, and that's integrated to different degrees in classrooms, depending or in classes, depending. Uh, it may be that I'm trying to track down that famous saying from Goethe about architecture is frozen music and I can't find it. So I go to the reference librarian and say, please help me find this out. And so tch, the dots are connected. So that's part of it. I I'm sorry, please. I didn't, I missed you. There's another dynamic. Um, yes. So I've got a 10-year-old and an 11-year-old. So my daughters are hopefully going to be a future university student. And yes. one of the great challenges they face growing up in this new context is navigating the 
Appalachian Swamp. Mm -hmm. So, what, what do you mean by swamp? I'm sorry. Uh, the plethora of uh, sources of information, kind of information, um, the, the endless uh, depths of YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, Google, when they're told by a teacher to go look something up, mm -hmm. where do they start? How mm -hmm. do they navigate? So, I think another role that's really important is helping people navigate to find the resources that are important mm -hmm. and relevant. It's got a new dynamic, and I think it's even more important. Information literacy is so vital, and um, it's become more and more important. I'm sorry to ask, were you here this morning? Or? I was not. I, I, I touched on it, on, on it very briefly, um, and, and information literacy is a, is a key thing. If I could just say a couple of words about this. Um, I've been doing research for about two years on this subject. And earlier, I should confess, I actually led bibliographic instruction at a, at a college for a bit, um, because this is fascinating. We took the term digital literacy and unpacked it a bit, and one stratum below that is the whole field of information literacy. And what's interesting is next to that, or below that chronologically, is the field of media literacy, which goes back to the 60s and 70s. So you have this idea of trying to look at mass media, like newspapers, magazines, um, you know, radio, TV, and trying to figure out what's in there. There are all kinds of exercises. So we now add the digital literacy layer to incorporate. And when we were investigating different countries or different digital literacy ideas, they really varied. So when we looked, for example, at Europe, most of the digital literacy definitions had to do with conforming to different European Union directives, which is interesting. They still had the idea of, you know, you should try to find good information and sift out bad. But it was really clearly aligned with that European perspective. Uh, we looked at African uh, information and digital literacy ones, and they were all about getting jobs. Uh, we looked at Middle Eastern ones, and they were all about trying to assess good and bad media, which says something really interesting about the contemporary Middle East. UNESCO did one, uh, so that attempted a global definition, and that included a whole bunch of arguments about the rights of citizens, including the rights of citizens to make content, the right to information, you know, very exciting stuff. And then uh, the uh, ACRL built their own uh, new framework, which is very exciting. So it may be, just forgive me for the digression, this is complicated stuff with a lot of depth to it, it may be that this is one of the jobs of a university is to really teach students this so that you can learn not just you know, how to sort good from bad, but also how to ethically respond. So if I find a bad story on Facebook, should I complain to Facebook about it as a bad story? Should I write a comment saying I think this is BS? Um, if, should I, if I'm on Twitter, how should I cultivate people in lists? Uh, all these different ethics, not to mention, I'm not going to talk about copyright, um, but this is the kind of thing which students aren't really going to get from many other places. K-12 through doesn't really have a lot of time to teach this. And once you're in the professional world, you're taught your professional skills. So I'll be more likely to be taught, which of you is the law, school, uh, the law library? So if I'm, in, if, I'm in, uh, if I'm a working lawyer, I'm more likely to be told how to use LexisNexis and how to use um, a few other databases and tools, and less likely to be taught how to use Google, for example, because one would expect I should know that already. So this could be a huge goal for uh, the RWU. And I submit, and from based on experience, so this can be taught online very easily. I mean, there are many, many modules, I'm sure you guys have seen these, of uh, information digital literacy. I'm really glad you mentioned that. One of the things I mentioned this morning is up until November 2016, it was hard for me to get faculty interested in this. Ever since, people are interested, uh, thanks to the, whatever you want to call it, the fake news epidemic, the age of the troll, or, or whatever. Well, think of those of you who were here before. Are there any topics that are, are staying in your mind that you want to address? Any problems, any concerns? So those of you who weren't here, we talked about a variety of topics, mostly technologies. We covered a bunch. Some are on this table. We talked about robotics. We talked about virtual reality. We talked about augmented reality, mixed reality. Uh, we talked about video. We talked about mobile devices, lots and lots of technologies. And beyond technologies, we talked a bit about demographics and about economics. And then at the end, I try to tie this all together with a few different major developments, including the idea of a higher education crisis. Uh, and so just thinking about it, and those of you who weren't here this morning, are there any ideas that have bubbled up in the past 35 minutes or so? Oh, please, someone had a hand up. Yes. Hi. Oh, oh. Sorry. Hi.
just sitting here, um, what I've been doing in the past to help students read the dense material that law students have to read, because yeah. a lot of the work I do is with students who have, um, some, some of them for the first time have had to read cases from 1930s and 40s. Oh my gosh. So a lot of work oh. I do is helping students oh. decipher words and material for the first time in, in, a, in a very detailed way that they've never had to do before. Mm. And I was just thinking that mm. what I've decided to try to do is to become more efficient by using technology to do some of those mm -hmm. that teaching because what I've had to do up until now to be effective is go one side by side in my office one on one yeah. with a student um, for a lot of reasons for the relationship building for the confidence building mm. Um, mm. and to kind of get a sense of where the student is emotionally mm. because law school can be very stressful yeah famously but I was thinking that if I can use videos more, because I've got three kids who go on YouTube all the time and they learn from YouTube, mm -hmm. if I can use videos more to at least get a student a little further along in the skills I want to teach them before they meet with me, I was thinking that's really why I'm here to use videos or that to connect the skills first and then still meeting with them one-on-one -on -one because that's it's kind of a nest for me it's a necessarily connection for a lot of the students I work with who are struggling yeah in law school. what a job oh my gosh um, just just really quickly um, the uh, Microsoft presenter is he still here okay uh, he, he, this morning he talked about the difference between uh, focusing on doing the form of the task rather than its purpose so I mean you're focusing on getting these students to become lawyers right. and so if the, if the if their mechanism is sitting next to them with paper or Showing them a video, the key thing is, does it work? Yeah. Um, oh, that's a what a huge task. I I, I was going to ask a couple of questions about this. Did you want to respond to this? Well, I wanted to raise another dynamic that relates to that. Please, um, please. That's the Khan Academy phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. when you talk about the tutorial worlds. Um, Not yet today. As Khan Academy becomes more mature, I can easily see Khan Academy doing legal methods one as a topic. Um, and discussing Iraq formation and all this stuff. Um, it, it's, there's so much basic content that can be delivered through a vehicle like Khan Academy at the rate of the students learning. Yeah. To get, ask the tutor to go again by hitting the review button. Yeah. And it frees up the classroom to do that kind of interpersonal engagement, enrichment stuff. My, my favorite example of this, I, I'm a Generation X person. I hate being autobiographical, um, but I'll mention this, this one. My, my wife teaches uh, emergency services classes, and she inherited one. And the entire class was all lectures, lectures up to three hours long. I didn't know this, but a lot of people go into the EMT world because they have ADHD. Um, they want something that's structured and also exciting, and they can get involved with it. And these lectures were killing them. They, they had to achieve a national exam result, and the pass rate was pathetic. It was like 20%. So they took all the lectures off, turned them into podcasts, because they were just audio, and then turned the class into role-playing, into exercises, lots of discussion, more practices. The pass rate went up to 65 70%. I mean, just a real basic flip the class. Um, it's you know, an example of it in, in, in part of, of, of what you're talking about. Um, isn't that where we should all be? Depends on the curriculum, I think, in many ways. I mean, you know, when you think about you know, the, the purposes of well, different... Well, in the, in, the, in, the, in the sense that there are things out there, there's a body of knowledge that you can get out, out of here, and then, and then there's more knowledge that you can cultivate out of talking to people. And, and so... But what makes... What I wonder about, though, is, is for example, in, in the case of EMT instruction, or in the case of law, Role-playing is a very, very powerful pedagogy. It predates the internet. It's a very powerful one that we can all use. In, say, uh, who, someone here had a partner who was in 17th century literature, that, that's a harder pedagogy to pull off, for example. I'm not saying that, therefore, they should lecture more. What I'm saying is that the curriculum would dictate different ways that plays out, as would, of course, the personality of the instructor. Um, I, I don't mean that in a whimsical way, just in terms of their practice and their skills. And, and how they play out. Well, is there a possibility that we can actually place ourselves at that point in time through hey. virtual reality? Isn't there a point in time where we're going to be able to place ourselves all in, a, in an environment that 
at that point in time that this yeah. is something that's happening? Yeah, we do it now, actually. I mean, uh, in, but, but in... But you can't recreate your mind to be the mind of a person living in that time, though. There's still going to be limitations about your ability to transport yourself to that time. <clears throat> Those limitations become the map of ignorance, in a sense, they become the power. Do you know the reacting to the past? Uh, Have you guys talked about this before? It's a fantastic pedagogy. Yes, we have a number of faculty. Yeah. Yes, excellent, excellent. Uh, are you the only one who hasn't said anything about it? It's, it's a role-playing exercise for historical simulation, where you simulate a very specific historical event that's often a court case or major decision. Uh, and you get if, the trial of Socrates, for example. And so people get to say primary source documents to try and reproduce different roles in those. It's, it's very popular. I, I, I taught a version of this online. I team taught a class on the Vietnam War. I taught it in literature. I had a colleague in history, a colleague in poli sci. And they developed a framework for simulating the Johnson administration's decision to escalate the war in 1964 and 65. So we had 10 different actors that our students had to simulate and role play, which was extraordinary in all kinds of ways. Most extraordinary was when we did it three weeks after September 11th. Really, really powerful stuff. Um, but I, 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 there's, a, there's a lot you can do with this. I want to come back to the question of, uh, of, of tutorials, and I want to come back to the question of teaching reading, as you were saying before. Tell me your name again, I'm sorry. Kathy. Kathy, thank you. Um, the tutorial world is huge. And I mentioned earlier that YouTube may be the world's single biggest cultural bazaar right now. Uh, people stage video, stage physical protest to be caught on YouTube because it's that powerful right now. Uh, and YouTube is filled with all kinds of informal, uh, informal content. Of all. Uh, I live half off the grid, and part of that is we heat entirely with firewood. And so I chop a lot of firewood, stack a lot of firewood, uh, which in Vermont we call this aerobics. Uh, but, <laughs> but one of the, so I learned, and this is where my nerd credit goes completely off the red, I learned about a medieval German wood stacking technique. And I was fascinated by this, called uh, Holzhausen. That's really cool, actually. So I went to YouTube and found a stack of videos. And then I tried this out. And got, oh, that's a problem. Made it work. And then shot videos myself and uploaded them. So any of these other completely demented people who want to learn more about this can, can do this. The tutorial world is really large. And again, we can feed that into AIs in many ways. But to come back to your, to your reading question, my first response was, does anybody here have any knowledge or thoughts that react to Ka Kathy, right? Mm -hmm. To Kathy's question. Have you seen any other ways of teaching difficult reading to students that you would throw at her? Because right, I had two quick ones, but I wanted to hear from other people. Right behind you is one. I'm just because that's, philosophy is infamous. For that's this. your whole life. Yeah, yeah, that's my whole life. Yeah. So how do you? So, well, we I I'm a generation Xer as well, um, but I also fall in between um, with the connection question. Mm -hmm. I'm at forty, so I uh, uh, we I go from. I'm on the wireless philosophy uh, team, and we use we partnered with Khan Academy to make tutorials, animated 10-minute tutorials for all the basic concepts in philosophy. Um, and so, after trying to read the text slowly, line by line, sometimes old, old texts or different, con you know, comparing different translations or mm -hmm. just just doing it that way to. A, a wireless philosophy 10 minute video on the same topic to a class discussion because you need the dialogue and community of learners. So yeah, multiple, as multiple ways as I can because the repetition seems to help. Paradox of the Ravens. Fantastic. Again, timeline Wi-Fi, how about that? I saw that, I saw, oh man, that was pretty tricky. Uh, so this is one response, is to have more faculty making more of this stuff. And again, it's in the open way. I mean, you use the word open, I think. Yeah, open access philosophy, so that anybody can use this. Uh, depending on, you know, if they're not at a university or anything else. That's a great answer. I, I hope that that's, that's one start. Does anybody else have any, other, any answers to show? Can, can I mention two really quick? Oh, please go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I, I mean, I... I, I... I feel like we need some more nuanced language, and, and you know, of course, nuanced language exists, but maybe not in sort of the, the common vocabulary that we're all used to used to speaking with. Uh, more nuanced language about about teaching versus content versus content delivery versus learning from that content. Right. I think we're in the, this beautiful golden age of content on YouTube, for example, sure. and Khan Academy, and I, I love that content. I use it all the time, 
but has it, has it fundamentally changed how I teach? I think the answer is no. I think, you know, I think uh, at the end of the day, the student somehow uh, has to spend that intellectual effort, right? right? That has to spend that intellectual <coughs> effort to understand. And if the tool is a way that, that allows me to make the student comfortable with spending that effort, that's great. It's a, it's a success. We could look at the history of, of all these different technologies. When books became uh, popularly available, they weren't too expensive for the common person to get a hold of, common student to get a hold of. It uh, were, they were voices saying, what's going to happen to the lecture? Couldn't we just put our best lectures in a book? And then, you know, shoot, our, our whole education system's going to die. And guess what? That didn't happen. When I was a kid, laser discs were in every classroom, right? <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was my, you know, my generation. Now, now we have YouTube, like Coursera, MOOCs, they're going to completely, and, and, and we can go, you know, decade by decade, cataloging all of these failures to live up to those promises. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not a failure of the medium. Right? I think it's a misunderstanding of what those, those venues of those platforms of content do, what their role is in the learning and teaching process. I wouldn't call them failures. I would say they're the failures. Well, I'd say they're failures uh, for the wrong question. Yes. Uh, because the, the cognitive act of trying to understand number theory, this is not going to alter that in the sense of the brain has to proceed through that. But what they are is questions of access, uh, which is really huge. So simply being able to, you know, my Holzhausen example is a little whimsical, but there was nobody I knew that I could ask about that. So I would otherwise be left in the dark. If I had a laser disc, it might have worked, but they're just, but the problem with laser discs, they were expensive to produce, and there weren't that many of them expensive to play. Uh, the same is true of books. I mean, we have a long, long history of correspondence courses, uh, people benefiting from having books available. Um, I mean, the history of the book is a pretty fascinating and disturbing thing to think about. This morning I mentioned that there was this development from around 1400 to 1700, people who thought they had too much to read. And it shows up in weird places. Um, the Fairy Queen, for example, a great English epic, uh, has this scene where our hero, the knight, is fighting a monster. The monster rears up above him, opens its mouth, and vomits out books. <laughs> Pamphlets, broadsides. I mean, that's the same. People thought, oh my gosh, this is terrible. We have so much to read. Uh, uh, it's kind of goofy. But we developed new ways of responding. And, and all kinds of ways. I was just going to show you two quick technologies, if, if you don't mind. Um, and one of them I'm biased about, so I have to confess. Uh, the one I'm not biased about is uh, Comment Press. Uh, so uh, this is a tool which lets you have comments running horizontally alongside um, a text. So let me see if I can pull up a good example of this. Uh, let's see. Oh, I haven't seen this one yet. Oh, okay. Let me take a look at this. So on the left, you, you don't have to read the text here. I can embiggen it for you, but it, it's the, the point isn't reading this necessarily. Um, is that's the the text that people are commenting on and responding to. So on a blog, you have a post, and hanging from the post is one or more comments, or none, depending. Uh, this puts them on the side, which makes it easier to read in a sense of dialogue. And then Common Press lets you do a few fun things so you can read through here. Um, sorry, I'm having a hard time with the trackpad here. Uh, I can look at this paragraph and see how many things people have said. I can look at every, all the comments on this one page. I can look at a person and follow them through and so on. Uh, it's a free download that fits into the WordPress blog. If that doesn't make sense or seem easy to you, talk to Russ and his team and they'll help you out. Okay. Um, you. This isn't brand new, so people, there's a lot of practice people have of using it. So it's, it's not like I'm saying, try this crazy thing. This is, this is pretty established. Uh, and it's pedagogically fascinating, uh, and people have used it in different ways. The second is a little more intimate, as it were, um, which is a hypothesis. Um, did anybody here use rap genius or genius back in the day? So an interesting question about digital documents is being able to annotate them. So if you get a PDF, it's actually kind of hard to do things to it. People have the desire to print them out and write on them by hand because the tools aren't that great. Uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro has a bunch of tools you can use to mark up, but they still feel kind of awkward. And I'll watch people poking at them on iPads trying to try to manipulate them. This is one. Um, 
where Hypothesis basically adds an annotation layer to anything on the web. Uh, and then you can comment and write to it. Now, while I'm saying I'm biased, I'm on their board. So, um, and I'm on their board because I like them. Um, that's the order of events. Um, but I would recommend checking them out. It's, it's a free tool and you can add an annotation layer. So you can ask your students to read this one Supreme Court decision from, say, Louis Brandeis and then, and then work through it carefully. Uh, and then, Thank you. oh, you're welcome. Uh, I'm very passionate about being able to read. Um, and my first, uh, um, my first scholarly publication, I I'm sorry, I forgot your name. You, you teach uh, composition. Dave, my first scholarly publication was actually a, a paper about teaching uh, composition with some technology, circa 1995. So it included the cutting edge technology of email. Uh, but uh, I was able to use email to change the way my students read, which just made me very, very happy. That's a good question. Um, I'm looking at the time. It says 3.05. And I don't know if that means we're out of time. Uh, I do know that it takes us closer to the apocalyptic moment of traffic. Um, and, uh, and, and in Boston, traffic is the worst, I think, in the United States, um, by and far none. The AAA did a study. They're trying to figure out who had the worst drivers. And I think it was Boston and Worcester. It was going to race to the bottom. The um, and uh, I, I didn't believe that. Um, no, I totally believe it. The, um, let me take a step back thinking about where you are, you've been talking about some of the theoretical and some of the very practical issues involved in productively and thoughtfully integrating technology into the undergraduate and graduate curricula, as well as into pedagogy. I'm delighted that in the past 45 minutes, without any pre-reading, without any, anything besides a crazy robot video, um, that we've hit on everything from constructivism to Spinoza to questions of markup and, uh, and mobile devices. Uh, I think strongly, I haven't made any recommendations, but one of them is this is the kind of conversation you need to have in order to figure out where this university can go ahead in the future. Um, you have these open discussions where people feel free to mention things that upset them or that don't work out and across all the different disciplines to have philosophy here, mathematics, architecture, biology, I think it's fantastic. Um, if I can come back to you, tell me your name again. Yes? Oh, Veronica. Veronica? And Ryan, right? Yes. I hope, I hope that these are the ways that we can better serve you uh, and make your careers here and elsewhere uh, more productive and positive. Um, I'm going to have to drive about five hours, um, so I'm going to need to get going pretty soon. I'll stick around here for about five minutes or so before I have to hit the road. But let me thank you all so much for your attention, your thoughts, and your time. Thank you. Thank you.